So welcome back friends to the homestead. So it is a very chilly Monday morning out here. Uh, spring is uh, spring is in the air, but it's not here yet. We keep, uh, just when we think it's all good, it's gonna let go and the summer is gonna come, we wake up into a half inch or inch of snow. It's happened like three times this week. But um, one thing that we can do today, and it's probably my favorite thing to do uh, of all the projects out here uh, is the forestry side of it. Um, when I think about uh, what, uh, the question that's been asked, you know, if you could do anything you wanted to do, you know, if you're job related or career related, what would that be? I think I enjoy, enjoy more than anything is uh, improving and tending to our timber stands, uh, planting, um, reclaiming the, the pasture land and putting things back into forestry. Um, another important aspect of that, of course, is the, the wildland fire side of it. Living out in the West, we are under constant threat of wildland fire, and there's a lot we can do as landowners um, to, to, to mitigate that. Uh, me, I have been a wildland firefighter for, well, I guess going on seven, seven seasons now, seven or eight seasons now. I have seen homes, I've seen beautiful properties build up just for lack of just minimal maintenance, things that the homeowner could have done had they done ahead of time that may have made a huge difference. So I try to get out here once a week or so and I work on this. It's uh, the eating the elephant analogy. When I f we first started uh, this huge piece of land and all this timber, it was in such uh, bad shape and had been neglected in some, as those of you who have followed the channel for a while know, some pretty uh, bad logging, poor logging practices. Um, the, the task of getting this into shape was, it was insurmountable. But we started in a little piece and before we knew it, you know, now we're probably 70% through it. And if we just keep picking away at it like I do and when we, the family, when we come out and, and work on little sections and even if we're like, okay, we're gonna do five trees today, um, after a while, after the years go by, pretty soon you, you, you've, you've got it all done. So uh, I'm gonna bring you in today. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. So uh, we have some pruning here of a very beautiful ponderosa pine. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about tool selection, what you can do, um, and just uh, good forestry pack practices and um, a little bit of stewardship thrown in. If your home is in the urban interface, if you're living amongst or with the forest, one of the most dangerous things uh, that you can have are for your trees uh, are what we call uh, ladder fuels. Uh, ladder fuels, what, what happens is if you have a big pasture like you have here and you've got grasses, uh, it's not so important right now because it's winter time and everything is, is laid down. There's not a lot of fuel here, but when springtime comes, when you get the green up and the grasses, the grasses down here will grow, um, you know, two and a half, even up to three feet high. And for, if you have large pieces of property, keeping everything mowed down and everything watered, it's, it's just not, not an option. It's, it's, too, it's a, too, too big of a job. We just can't get to it. But what we can do is we can remove these ladder fuels. And what a ladder fuel means is if a lightning strike or embers blow over here and they land in this grass, well, we've all seen what happens in a grass fire, how, far it how quickly it takes off. Uh, it, it will burn very fast. It can burn in upwards of 60 miles an hour if pr pressed by enough wind. And what happens is uh, that fire will burn in here through these flashy fuels. It'll burn fast and hot. It doesn't stay around very long because there's not a lot of substance there with the grass. It'll just pass through. However, this here is bread and butter for those fires. If you have your pine trees or your fir trees or your cedars, your conifers that are laying down here on the ground like that, it acts as a ladder. That's why we call it ladder fuels. It acts as a ladder for that fire to come through here, start burning, and then ladder up into the tree and get into what we call the crowns, the top of the trees. And once it's in those crowns, then it can jump from crown to crown to crown. And when you go from a grass fire to a crown fire, well, then you have a whole nother thing. It's, it's, uh, you're going to lose all your trees. Simple solution. Because these fires come through so quickly and so hot, and these, these trees have quite a bit of moisture in them, they can withstand quite a bit of heat. If we can remove these ladder fuels, even up to just the height that we can reach with a normal handsaw, we will save those trees nine times, well, probably more than that, almost all, every time the fire will come through. And instead of being a, a destructive force, it's going to destroy our forest and our timber stands. It's going to actually be beneficial. The amazing thing 
the way God has designed the ecosystem is that fires are a natural cleanser. Fires are actually good for the conifers. And, and the, the thing that makes a conifer throw cones the most, to talk about the Douglas firs, for example, uh, is wildland fire. The heat from the flames that come up from a, from a fire, a creeping fire, or a fire that runs through in the duff or in, in the, in the, on the bottom story of the canopy, uh, well, that heat will cause those cones to open up and throw those cones and it will, it will germinate trees all over the place. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible system, but this here is a problem. So I'll show you how we can fix that very simply um, and you can go a long ways in saving your forest. You don't need a lot of fancy tools to get this job done. I would rather have you go through and cut everything up that you can reach to a height of, you know, for most guys, that's going to be probably about eight feet or so, uh, then, um, you know, really get carried away and then have to invest in a lot of pole saws and expensive equipment, or even I see guys getting lifts and things out there. If once the most important thing is to get those ladder fuels removed on your trees. And then if you want to expand upon that, then you can go back out and you can maybe take things up to 12, 14, 16 feet if you want, but you're basically not really improving your efforts too much if you're not dealing with a whole bunch of fuel on the ground. But the best, um, and I have worn out lots of saws, uh, is this one right here, the Samurai, the Ichiban. Forestry work is a lot like hunting in that the, the easy part is pulling the trigger, right? Well, the easy part is cutting the branch off. The, the hard part, or the labor-intensive part, is dealing with all of the brush and, and all of the limbs. I'll show you a method uh, that will, after many, many years of, <laughs> of experience, will make life a lot easier. Uh, the first thing you're gonna do is you, you're gonna go in and kind of open up the tree, and you're gonna cut the largest branches first that you can reach. This is a pretty big branch. This is a four inches or so, but uh, with, with a good Japanese saw, it'll cut very quickly. But cut the biggest branches first, and then I'll show you how to stack and why. Now when you're stacking your branches, don't start your pile too far away uh, from the tree, uh, that, you, that you're gonna have to make many steps in carrying it. And the, the branches are gonna grow with a kind of a natural arc in them, um, make them, think, think of an igloo, you know, make them so that they're arching like this. You'll be able to stack more in a smaller pile than if you, if you stack them the other way. And always put all of the butts together like this. Now, there's going to be two things you're going to do. You're, if, you're, if you are going to leave things where they, where they lay, uh, meaning that, and there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to cut your branches and stack them up neatly like this, they make a tremendous habitat for all sorts of creatures. You'll get squirrels and chipmunks and birds and bugs. They just love this, especially in a, a field like this because it gives them a refuge from, from raptors and predators. Um, they'll, they'll come in here and they'll hang out and they'll do just fine. Now, if you're going to do that, you might want to take the, your branches a little bit further away from your trees. And think about if you're doing multiple trees, if you're working with multiple people or you're working with your family, and you've, if you've got five trees, if you can find a central area where it's, it's equal distance between all of those trees and make your pile right there, then you know, that's, that's a good way to do it because then you, you're going to save a lot of time and effort. Now, granted, if you're going to leave them take them a little bit further away from the tree because this will be a jackpot for a wildland fire. It'll, it'll have been sitting here drying all summer long. And once the fire hits this, this will go up and it'll throw embers everywhere. So keep, get it away from your trees. Now, uh, if you're going to burn it the same way, take it a little bit further away because this will get hot. I've had some of these piles that have, I've put them too close to trees and the fire was so intense that it actually scorched and singed some of the healthy trees around and, and ended up killing them. Um, the other option is if you have ma machinery or a tractor, piling it up like this um, and using, if you have a, a brush rake or a grapple, is going to be, you'll be able to come in here, which I'll show you in a minute, and grab this whole pile with one, one clump and put it wherever you want to. So if that's the case, then you can put it a little bit closer. But let's uh, finish up uh, the tree and uh, I'll show you a couple of the tricks. The reason I told you to put the, the bigger branches down first uh, is to, to help, because that's going to kind of kind of create a mat uh, to hold and to carry the smaller ones. Let's say we've got some smaller branches on the trunk. I'll, I'll just demonstrate by the, cutting a couple of these off. Now these are going to be really hard to pick up. And if you cut uh, 25, 50 of these, you have to bend over to pick up each one that you drop on the ground and it's just, it's really hard on you. So if you can save these for last, 
then we can put these on the big mat, just like this. Now that we've got the, the big ones down here and all the branches, we can kind of, you know, just, just throw those in there, weave those in there. And now when we move the piles, uh, this is all going to stay together in one big bunch and we're not bending over, picking up or raking up a bunch of little pieces. There isn't any question that a guy can do more work with a chainsaw. However, the amount of uh, stress it puts on you, um, how it diminishes, I guess, the whole experience with the hearing protection and the noise. If you're working in the summertime, the extra heat uh, from the chainsaw chaps and all the equipment, to me, it just doesn't pan out. It, it's, it's not worth it. Um, I, I enjoy this so much and the saws are so efficient that uh, if it takes a few more seconds to cut a branch, it's well worth it. Now when you're cutting your branches, and another thing with the chainsaw is, I don't care how careful you are, you can, at the end of the day, when you start getting tired, you're gonna come in here and you're gonna start getting too close and you're gonna start uh, knocking bark off, off the tree and you're gonna, you can damage the tree, especially on the little, the little ones that have really tender bark like the Douglas firs do. So when you're cutting, uh, it's okay to stay away from the trunk, um, three quarters of an inch or even an inch or so. Um, it, uh, you run less risk of damaging uh, the bark. And what you get here is, is you get as this starts to rot and the tree will actually will, will start to heal itself and it will seal around here. It gives it kind of a knob on there and a little bit of protective wood uh, to prevent that rot and to, you know, from getting, or critters from getting into the trunk. So even though maybe it doesn't quite look as nice to some folks to have those sticking out there, I mean, don't leave them out so far where they're gonna catch on stuff, but, but if you wanna leave it out half inch, quarter, three quarter inch, whatever, um, that's, that's just, just as well. Cut these branches up as high as you can reach. If you say for, if you say that you're, uh, you know, your six foot example, you can reach up to eight, and with a saw you can cut up to nine. I like to see eight foot as a minimum. It gets to be kind of a strain to cut up that high, but what you can reach up comfortably is going to be about eight feet. And that's, uh, that's usually going to be real, real good. That's uh, perfect. That's enough that you can drive equipment underneath of it without scratching up the top or your truck. Um, it's going to prevent a lot of uh, fire from getting up in the tree. And uh, it's a whole lot better than, uh, than nothing. Here's a rare find. This is a pine knoll. You'll find them, they're, not, they're pretty rare, you don't find them very often, but if you do come across one, let me cut it off here. Right there, it's a, it's a real dense uh, portion of the tree, in the pine tree, and it's got a lot of the, the sap, or the pitch, as my granddad used to call it, in it. And these, were, these are, are great for if you're gonna build a small cooking fire, or you want a little fire that's gonna burn hot for a long time, um, Native American Indians, Native Americans, uh, early settlers would, would gather these uh, and use these for small cooking fires and warming fires. And uh, that's what they look like. You'll find them, uh, there's, usually you find them around here on the Ponderosas. Here's another little treasure to look for when you, if you're out. If you ever get lost in the Western United States, especially if you're in a w winter time and everything is wet and you, you need to get a fire started, uh, look for this. You'll see it, uh, this pitch or sap, this resin. You'll see it on uh, the dug firs. You'll see it on the, the ponderosas. It'll be running on the tree. You can start a fire practically underwater with this stuff. You can touch a match to, to it and it will burn long and it'll burn hot. It'll drip down over top of the fire, the wood that you have and, and usually get a fire going. My grand, that's one of the first things my granddad taught me in, in uh, woodcraft. Uh, was to look for this. When we used to go hunting, he'd, whenever he'd find a good piece like this, he'd stop and take his knife and cut it off and put it in a bag and put it in his pocket. He always saved it and kept a little bag of this. This is the best fire starter 
uh, that you can get and it's uh, it's free so that's it this tree is done if I had to say how long would it take me to do a tree like this I figured about this size about 10 minutes I can do one by myself and stack everything up so if you do have a big forest um, you say okay I'm gonna take an hour you know it doesn't take very every day it doesn't take very long and, and you can knock out big swatches swashes of it especially if your family's helping you now I'm six foot four um, and I can reach to almost eight feet so you can see that that we are indeed are limbed up about eight feet or so and this tree here will be safe uh, from any ground fire it, I don't care how hot or how fast the winds blowing it through here uh, most likely is going to be just fine they'll survive it not only will it survive it but it'll it'll thrive it doesn't take long long for limbs they they really do uh, stack up now you'll notice that this pile is pretty close to the canopy there if I were to if this were to dry out and I were to light this it most likely would permanently damage that tree. But I have a, a grappler on the front of the Yanmar um, and I'll grab these things and we actually burn. Another option I didn't mention is, is you can also burn, burn the branches, which is I think is the best way to go um, if you don't have a big chipper. A lot of folks say, oh, it's such a shame to, it's such a shame to, uh, to burn this stuff when you could have, when you could chip it and get the mulch. But the reality of it is the, the industrial chipper that is required to do a forest on this scale is, is just not something that's, that's gonna be available to most of us. What is available is a burn pile. So burning, I think, is probably the best way to go. Now, since I'm gonna move these things, I'm not gonna move them right away. And it's because they're all fluffy, you know, they're all, they're all uh, uh, it's really tall and, and springy and, and it, it's, it's a big old pile to get on a, a small tractor like I have. I'll let this sit. Let this sit through the summer, or halfway through the summer, maybe right before fire season. I've got, we'll have these piles all over the place, and they'll settle down. As the branches die and, and they relax and the needles lose some of their loft, it'll, it'll start to sink down, sink down. In, in just a few months, it, this pile will be half this height. Then I can reach in there and I can grab it, and then we can take it to a central area and, and have, a, have a big burn. So let me show you what, kind of what the before tree looks like, and then one, one more on the after. So here's a similar tree before, tons of ladder fuels. The branches are actually growing into the grass and the duff. This tree will go up like a, like a Roman candle. And the after, everything cleared out. We could have a fire running through here. The tree will be safe. It's not going to be compromised by a fire and it just looks better. Another reason for clearing out or limbing up your timber stands like this that's not often discussed is uh, to me, which is a big one, is uh, security. Um, back in the day, you know, houses, uh, dwellings were, were situated, they were arranged and the placement of bedrooms and, and windows were arranged so that you could see who was coming. Uh, if you lived in a, a rural location um, and you had a driveway in and, and you, you know, there was a threat of uh, who knows what, you would, uh, you'd always want your master bedroom that you could, if you heard a bump in the night, you could see out towards the front door. You could see out at the, uh, where, where any sort of harm or threat would be coming. We've complete, uh, that mindset I think is completely lost on most people. We live in such a, a safe area or a safe environment that we don't even think about those any, anymore. But I, you know, I'm not comfortable. I, I don't want to be surprised when someone knocks on the door. Uh, if I'm uh, enjoying dinner with my family or I'm, uh, if we're resting in the living room after a day's work, I want to know, be able to look and see. It's not paranoia, it's just common sense. I want to see if someone pulls up. I want to see if someone's coming through my gate. Uh, I want to know what's going on. And this, uh, especially with this, you, uh, anyone can hide uh, in, in a forest like this where you have trees. You can go from tree to tree to tree and you would never know. They could sneak right up on you. They would, you wouldn't even know they were there. Not to mention predators. We, have, we live in the midst of uh, uh, cougar, mountain lion, um, bear, uh, all, all sorts, sorts of critters. We've got lots of kids around here. So I want to see, you know, if we're going down here or the kids are playing, I want to be able to do a scan and see, no, there's not a bear hiding in that bush or there's not a mountain lion that's waiting to pounce on, on one of the children uh, because he's taking cover of some of these branches or there's not some, some you know, bad person that's bent on doing something harmful to me and my family uh, using this as cover to sneak up on the house. So again, it's not paranoia. It's just good common sense. I want to be able to, I mean, I'm the, the master of my castle. My, my job, um, my prime, one of my primary roles as a husband and a father is to protect and to look after my family. 
And you know, I do those sweeps. I want to be able to look out and do a scan and see, yeah, there's all clear. There's, there's no one sneaking up on me in the field or there's not a predator down there or there's not, I, I want to know what's going on. It's just part of the responsibility we have as husbands and fathers uh, to look after a family. So that's the, the security part of it. Uh, is important as well. So thanks for watching. If you enjoy these for, these forestry videos, I invite you to click a thumbs up, um, leave a comment. It helps uh, um, and, and it's a way you can show support. Um, I'm going to do an amendment or a second part of this video um, covering, we'll get into the details of saws. Uh, some of my favorites, what I like, what I don't like, what I have found to be um, the perfect saw. Uh, and we'll do that on the next part. So look forward to that. Thanks for watching and we'll see you guys on the next video.